I've always loved science fiction in every form. I get out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one, and another one, and another one. For the power of its ideas. It was! And for the big questions it asks. What's out there in the universe? How will the world end? Will our technology destroy us? That are alive, you are coming with me. And above all, He's alive! what can we learn from these fantastic stories? So who wants to say action, you or me? You, go on. Okay, action. I think I always have been a sci-fi fan. What's possible? What's gonna happen? And that's kind of like seeing in the future. It's just boom, right at you. Phew. Science fiction shows you all the possibilities. At that point, it's beyond science fiction. It's a statement about humanity. We'll do things that we cannot even imagine today. But it's great entertainment. Exactly. This is a whole genre that's just exploding because it's so much more fun than a lot of the other genres. So badass and cool and empowering. You're constantly saying what if. And if you're not saying what if, you're a fool. Anything is possible. Ray Bradbury and Arthur Clarke and Robert Heinlein. That was it. I was hooked. Concept of the universe is so mind-boggling. And then there's also that line of science fiction fantasy. I think monsters tell us everything about ourselves. Science fiction is just that special to me. And we love it. And we can't get enough of it. And so we can't stop. You've done, I think, over your entire oeuvre between directing and producing, you've done many films about first contact or invasion. Was that what was inflaming your, your young imagination? My father was the one that introduced me to the cosmos. Right. He's the one that built from a big cardboard roll that you roll rugs on, mm -hmm. he built a two-inch reflecting telescope. Oh, cool. And then I saw the moons of Jupiter. It was yeah. the first thing that he, he, he pointed out to me. And I saw the rings of Saturn around Saturn. And and I'm six, seven years old when yeah. this all happened. And so for me, the so you, cosmos. You spent a lot of time staring at the sky. A lot of time looking yeah. at the sky. It woke me up in the middle of the night. It's scary when your dad walks into your bedroom and it's still dark. And he says, come with me. Your dad took you out to watch a meteor shower. It, it was a Leonid shower. Yeah, right, right. And, and he took me to a knoll mm -hmm. somewhere in New Jersey. And there were hundreds of people. Lying on picnic. Well, that scene is right in Close Encounters. Absolutely. It's the same I put scene. the scene in Close Encounters. Yeah. And uh, I got out there and we laid down on a knapsack, his mm -hmm. army knapsack, and mm -hmm. we looked up at the sky. Oh, and awesome. every 30 seconds or so, there was a brilliant flash of light that streaked across the sky. And I, I just remember, uh, you know, looking at the sky because of the influence of my father and saying, if I ever get a chance to make a science fiction movie, I want those guys to come in peace. I got a call from my agent saying, there's a job. Steven Spielberg's directing a movie. It's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I said, excuse me? So I have this audition coming up, so I, I practice a little bit of what I, I think will help me get the job. And Steven says, well, we'd love you to do this movie. You'd be Francois Truffaut's interpreter. The only thing is, we just need to hear what your French is like. Is your French good? I said, Il y avait beaucoup d'années depuis que j'ai parlé français, si vous me donnez ce boulot, ce sera très difficile pour moi. None of them spoke French, and they said, Great, you've got the job. Your French is terrific. <laughs> Avez-vous parché récemment une rencontre? Have you recently had a close encounter? Une rencontre plutôt inhabituelle? A close encounter with something very unusual. Who are you, people? Close encounters of the third kind had an original title called Watch the Skies, and if you're a real science fiction buff, you know where that comes from. Every one of you listening to my voice, tell the world, tell this to everybody wherever they are, watch the skies. So Close Encounters of the Third Kind, its original title, built a bridge back to that 1950s classic science fiction film, The Thing from Another World. Happy birthday, you little 
that they're thing from another world, you? Oh, thank you. The character of Richard Dreyfuss in Close Encounters is really interesting because he is not a hero. He's not a good dad. He's not a good husband. He gives up everything to seek out this idea that there is life on other planets. He's just an absolute everyday guy working for the power company, and he has an inexplicable experience that he cannot deal with. When that thing flies over his truck, his life has changed. Characters are kind of ripped apart. It's definitely suggested that his obsession with aliens is, is really harming his kid and his wife. Well, I guess you've noticed something that's a little strange with Dad. I can't describe it. This means something. It raises the question of how far would we be willing to go to communicate with aliens? I understand why you're always criticized for it, but I'm also greatly relieved that there are people in this world that will listen to that voice inside them and pursue it. You felt uh, compelled to be here? <laughs> yeah, you might say that. Because what did, you, you but what did you expect to find? An answer. That's not crazy, is it? Close Encounters of the Third Kind did something different with aliens. Instead of having aliens just as mostly fearsome monsters who only wanted to drink our blood or rule us, it said there's a lot of amazing stuff out there in the universe, and you're going to walk away awestruck. And Stephen knew just how to create a reaction of wonderment, happiness, and awe at the same time. There's a scene in Close Encounters when something has landed. Carrie has to open this door and look and see these amazing things. Stephen had a number of people from the movie dress up in giant costumes, a rabbit costume, a mouse costume, and said, OK, Carrie, now open the door. And Carrie opened the door. And you could see the wonder in his eyes, the excitement, the happiness. Holy! Holy! I think science fiction as a genre has definitely always had a kind of social, political, cultural message that's generally contained in the stories that are written, you know? It's not the normal world, but it's dealing with the things that we deal with in our world. And that's the playground that science fiction plays in. I've seen it twice. Have you? And cried both times. Mm. I think it's a very emotional experience, very beautiful one. I think it's probably the most important film of the last 20 years. It is a movie written by a director and writer who is searching for meaning in his life. He's a very introspective person. I think he needed to make a movie that provided some kind of answer to what's the meaning of life. In a way, this isn't a movie so much about the aliens themselves. What it's really about is us, you know, how are we going to feel when we become aware of a life bigger than ours? What would we do? Are we willing to do what Richard Dreyfuss did? Are we better people than Roy? Or maybe Roy is a better version of us? You really created a kind of almost alternate spirituality or alternate religion. Yes, and, and infinite superior civilization is going to find the best of you and is going to pull the best of you out right. of yourself. It, and you will present the best part parts of yourself, the, as Lincoln said, the better angels of your nature. Yeah, exactly. A, 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 and that's what goodness does. You know, you know, good doesn't inspire evil. Good, you know, propagates a greater good. Right. And that's what I thought that the best science fiction does. I think one of the most important things as a filmmaker, at least of the kind of awe and wonder type stories that we're both attracted to, is to stay that kid. Part of that means fighting off the natural urge of cynicism as we take everything in. It's a battle. Yeah. It's a battle for me. It's, it continues to be a struggle for me yeah. to want to look on the, the bright side. More than any other genre, science fiction is the great what if. What would happen if we woke up tomorrow and there were spaceships larger than cities hovering above us? Evil alien disasters are exciting because we get to vicariously live through our fears of annihilation while comfortably sort of eating popcorn. The Alien Invasion movie is absolutely a metaphor for 
the human's darkest side. The invasion of aliens destroying our planet is us destroying our planet. One of my favorite alien invasion narratives is actually a classic episode of The Twilight Zone called To Serve Man. Aliens arrive and humans are like, oh, what are you here for? And they're like, we want to serve you. We are here to help you. Later, humans sneak on board the alien ship and find a book there. To serve man, I hope so. And eventually they translate it and find out it's a cookbook. It's a cookbook! I think we use aliens to portray our dreams, our wishes, our desires, what we wish we could be. Most often, I think we use aliens to portray our fear of the unknown. And in doing that, we see all of these aliens invade. Independence Day really captured all of the things I had dreamed as a child. And part of what I wanted to do was bring regular guy to science fiction that's really not happy about his planet being invaded. Welcome to Earth. The movie needed a moment where we felt that we were dealing with an enemy beyond our capabilities. At the time, the idea of the White House was an image of strength, of, of power. Today, we are doing the explosion of the White House. Roll camera. The White House explosion was always in question. We had it in the script, and it was a very important visual for us in the movie. But uh, the studio was very skittish about it. They said to me, Roland, you're German. You don't understand. You cannot blow up the White House. And I remember Roland saying, so you mean it would be very controversial and everybody would talk about our movie and that's bad? Why? <laughs> so yeah, the, it stayed in the picture. And action! We were trying to give a, a, a feeling of hopelessness. No one ever thought in those days that giant landmarks would blow up the way they did. This was pre-9-11. The image of the, the White House blowing up was the tipping point for Independence Day. I remember I, I was sitting in, in a theater. I was a couple rows uh, behind a guy, and the White House blew up. And the dude said, oh, man, that's bad. That's bad. That's, oh, man, that's bad. He said, great, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> Independence Day actually tries to allude to a lot of classical science fiction, both as a way to appeal to the fans, but also as a way to give audiences anchor points for interpretation. From uh, Hal, the computer, Good morning, Dave. to the bubbling clouds with the spaceship hidden inside of it from Close Encounters, we added a line for Jeff Goldblum as he's escaping the spaceship. Must go faster. Must go faster. That's directly from Jurassic Park. Must go faster. The computer virus is a nod to War of the Worlds, where a actual virus kills the aliens. You can't make a movie about an alien invasion without tipping your hat to War of the Worlds. It is the godfather of all alien invasion movies. But in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and surely drew their plans against us. Hello, I'm Orson Welles, and I've been quoting from another Welles, no relation, H.G. Wells, the distinguished novelist, historian, prophet, who was also the great master of science fiction. H.G. Wells was a British writer at the beginning of the 20th century who was one of the most significant early science fiction writers. He was also a very accomplished science writer and used science fiction to explore what he considered to be important ideas. Mr. Wells, have you any uh, uh, solution for the very unhappy state of affairs that uh, is facing the world today? It seems to me that many things besides the pound are threatened with collapse. War of the Worlds is a story, I think, which Wells intended to be a confrontation with ourselves. What happens if a society or a civilization with superior technology and superior weapons decides it wants to take over a civilization with less advanced technology. He was writing in the 1890s when Britain had been doing this in India, had been doing it all over the world. He's saying, how does it feel when it happens to you? War of the Worlds is such a perfectly pure alien invasion story. You can just kind of pour out the old fears that somebody else was using it to talk about, and then pour in the new fears that you're experiencing now. By 1938, Orson Welles is applying it to this 
threat of Nazism and the impending war. Good heavens, something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. By the 1950s, we've got the atomic threat. The aliens now represent what will happen with nuclear destruction. This type of defense is useless against that kind of power. And then you fast forward to Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, in which there's more of a sense of post 9-11 catastrophe. Get out, get out, get out! I wouldn't have done War of the Worlds had it not been for 9-11. Because War of the Worlds is, is, is analogous to 9-11, an event in our American culture and in the global, you know, history of, of, of you know, terrorism. And, 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 uh, and, and America is not a country that's used to being attacked. The last time we were attacked like that was Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, yeah. But and, you, man you managed to turn it into a family drama that pulled everybody together. Yeah, it was one that said, we have to make this a, a story about a single dad who doesn't really even care about his kids. Right. And somehow this event has to make him care about his kids more than he ever cared about himself. Right. And so that became the nucleus. This idea of the perils of encounter that H.G. Wells started in his War of the Worlds novel is an idea that has really fascinated us ever since. The idea that everything we know could be destroyed in an instant. And then all of a sudden, Hollywood played into that through the sci-fi genre with a lot of movies in which these aliens are coming to destroy us in very sort of overt, bombastic ways. And like Invasion of the Body Snatchers in a much more subtle, subversive type of way. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a lot scarier in some ways than your alien swooping in from the sky, War of the Worlds type of battle, because you don't really know who's an alien, who's not. Is that me? Invasion of the Body Snatchers is about a conspiracy in which people are being replaced by aliens from outer space and generating new versions of themselves in pods that take them over. But something is missing. They don't have your individuality or maybe some other kind of human spark that make us most spectacularly, magically human. It's 1956, and certainly the film has been talked about and considered in relation to the threat of communism, the lockstep kind of ideology where everybody had to be the same. The term at the time was creeping conformity. Who hasn't felt that? where you're just talking to somebody and they're not them. And you know, you're looking at them saying, you're not the person I know. You, you've been taken over. Is that him? Yeah. Really, it's sort of like a metaphor. Do you really want to feel or do you not want to feel? Do you, would you rather just go through life living in that gray area with no real expression of oneself? <laughs> Science fiction enables us to deal with that fear and that terror and those subconscious motivations without getting too close to home. It's a powerful metaphor and it's an awful warning. They're coming, listen to me! You're an expert in danger! Please listen to me, something terrible! They're already here! Help! You're next! Do you take it as read that aliens exist or, or is it a wait and see kind of thing? I think for me, I think any statistical analysis, if you're going to go by statistics and you look at Carl Sagan looking at the idea of what are the mathematics behind is there life on the planets, mm -hmm. those same statistics are going to tell you that yes, there have been civilizations in the past, if there have been, if there is intelligent life off the earth. But I also think that one of the hardest things to, to wrap your head around in terms of our pace of the universe is if we are intended to connect with other planets or other civilizations. They're so far away. There is some chance that in the next few decades, we will get a signal from some spectacularly distant, spectacularly exotic civilization, and everything on Earth will, as a consequence, change. Carl Sagan was so consumed with the idea that there was life elsewhere, it drove him to write a fabulous story about it in contact. What Carl really was about was communicating. He thrived on how people and how species and how tribes and how cultures communicate. That was his thing. Because he was going to communicate with the stars. Communication becomes one of the most important themes in science fiction. At the same time, it becomes one of the most important puzzles in science fiction. In Stanislaw Lem's Solaris, we're faced with a sentient ocean 
What does Solaris want from us? Why do you think it has to want something? In Star Trek, an amorphous cloud. I do not understand. And in Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, communication can be tough when aliens look like this. There is no need to be afraid. One of the best stories about alien communication in modern science fiction is Ted Chang's Story of Your Life, which became one of the best science fiction films of the last few years, Arrival. Now that's a proper introduction. I really loved Arrival because it was all about communication and how many times communication was just thrown out before you see it work. It's so impressionistic, right? I mean, there's a hard work to, to bring to the screen. I thought that brought its unique challenges, and I thought they succeeded in a really cool way. Ted Chang's original story, Story of Your Life, is that we are contacted by an alien race, the heptapods, and they seem to want to exchange information with us one of the things I wanted to do with my story that I hadn't seen in a lot of other science fiction was to actually depict the process of learning an alien language when you actually have to painstakingly work out vocabulary and grammar. Okay, this is where you want to get to, right? That is the question. Okay. What is your purpose on Earth? This is the question we're all trying to get to, and crossing that language barrier may mean the difference between the end of the Earth and the dawning of a new idea. What does it say? Offer weapon. The distinction between tool and weapon becomes crucial. It turns out, of course, that what they intend is not at all a weapon, but a tool, in fact, a gift. And the gift is their language. And so it becomes this story not so much about an alien invasion, but about communication, about two species trying to connect with each other. The key part of it is that this is nonlinear. There's no beginning and no end. All the elements are there, and you see it immediately as a whole. In fact, you see your whole life laid out in front of you. And the more she understands their language, the more she understands their consciousness. And because their consciousness transcends time, she starts to remember the future. The aliens in Arrival, they are a way of talking about a radically different mode of cognition, different ways of thinking, different ways of looking at the universe. There's an age old question of how language relates to thought, how language might influence thought. You know, I was doing some, some reading um, about this idea that if you immerse yourself into a foreign language that you can actually rewire your brain. Yeah, it's that Wharf hypothesis. The movie explicitly references something called the Sapir Wharf hypothesis. What it says is your language creates habits of speech and those habits of speech translate into habits of thought. And so your language makes you habitually think in certain ways which have a significant impact on the way you see the world. The question is how much? I believe that our language absolutely does inform our reality and shape it. I would think that uh, the way that the heptapods language really reshapes Louise's experience of time is an extreme of that. But I do believe that the language that we constantly recycle in our own world absolutely shapes our reality and can be our own prison. What I find beautiful about the end of Arrival is that Louise knows that her future is gonna bring a lot of pain and joy if she falls in love, if she has a baby, and when that baby dies. She knows she's gonna make mistakes that are gonna drive her husband away, and yet she chooses that pain. It's this idea of knowing that what you're about to do is going to bring you pain, but knowing that the happy moments are gonna be worth it. And that's a really beautiful thought.
I talk to kids and they say, where'd you get the idea for all those aliens? Where'd you think that up? I said, well, go to the aquarium. You're gonna see them all there. That's what I did on Avatar. Yeah. I took the, I took the ocean, I took all my diving, and I, well, and I just it, brought it into to the... To me, that's one of the most brilliant yeah. things in Avatar. One of the biggest problems you have in science fiction with movies, they don't have it in books or anything, but in movies, you have to create a real world. And it's a real world that doesn't exist. It's really, really hard, and it takes a long, long time. Right. Because you've got to create something that's truly unusual and different, but familiar, so you believe it. Yeah. And so after a while, it can fry your brain. But now that we've got digital technology, you can think of anything. I always find the morphology of the anatomy of aliens interesting. You know, science fiction writers, they're like these imagination engines. That's what they are. Maybe they have four limbs as we do. Maybe they look like a spider, which seems to be a very popular choice. Maybe they look like an octopus or a squid. I always like to look at nature, but when coming up with a creature, it's always you want to create some kind of like aspect of reference, where you're coming from. What is this creature going to evoke? It's not just about biology, but it's about our own psychology as well. And that's our job, is to, is to give tactility to the, the creature so that you evoke the desired response, whether it's one of awe or joy or love or what it might be. Obviously, you can make them very friendly by giving them big eyes and big foreheads, the cute features that we see in modern humans. But aliens that are scary to human beings seem to always be slimy and reptilian for that revulsion response. In literature, you can sort of describe something in, in vague terms. You know, maybe um, H.P. Lovecraft would say that I gazed upon its visage and it sickened my soul or whatever he would say. But that's not really a, a real description. For an artist, you have to bring that to life. And I think the single artist who has most successfully defined this importance of the look of a creature, in my opinion, has got to be H.R. Giger, who designed the original xenomorph. I was industrial designer, and it helped me very much to design a creature. The xenomorphs have a, a fantastic basic design that employ all sorts of psychosexual imagery as well as death imagery. And, you know, the phallic head and its life cycle that basically starts with rape. What the hell is that? When I first met Ridley Scott, he pulled out all these drawings. It was a very sinister. Uh, world and not a world I'd ever seen in a film. In fact, I, I remember thinking, I don't see how you can make a film look like this. If you look at Ridley's movie, you know, it hasn't dated. And I think that plays to a lot of strengths of Giga's design for the alien. You know, it's really a man's life's work that Ridley got to take and put on screen. I feel pretty strongly that you created the best alien movie in history. Most beasts are not very good. Yeah. Or re repetitions of other creatures that we have seen. Films have been ruined by showing the beast finally. As Stephen did in Jaws, the shark was exclusive to two or three frames like yeah. that. Our biggest problem would be right. to make this work. I said, because I haven't got digital, it's all going to be a guy. We didn't have any of that stuff no. back then. But in this, I, he's present. I can't cut around him. Yeah. I have to see you, it. But you did it with your eye and yeah. your taste. Yeah. And you recognize the value of Hans Rudi Giger's psychosexual biomechanoid. Yes. The trick there is, is one picture from Necronomicon. Oh, from Giger's book. It's the profile. This is the painting, uh, the alien that Ridley Scott wanted to have for his film. It's like showing me a dirty postcard. He said, look at that. I went, holy good God. And from that, the person in the studio said, they were uncomfortable, but it was obscene. I said, obscene's good. Yeah. Disturbing and obscene is very good. Sexually yeah. disturbing is very good. Yeah. Play the fear. It played yeah. the fear. The film was all about evolution of fear. Most of the xenomorphs combine both masculine and feminine sexual characteristics. And that's terrifying to us because one of the ways we make sense of the monstrous and of others is by trying to map them in some way that matches our own understanding of existence. And one of the key ways that we think about humanity is in terms of gender. It's the first question we ask when we hear a new baby is born. 
The problem with the aliens is that they blend together, the two, and so are no longer understandable and controllable. Now, uh, put, your, put your hands on the dome, like you're stroking it. Remember, like that Giger thing? Ridley met Badejo Balaji at a pub. He was an art student. He was about seven feet four. His limbs were so beautiful and exotic that he already looked like he was from another world. The days when Balaji came in, we didn't hang out with him. He is the unknown. And it's really a combination of strange beauty and elegance and sex and violence that I think make the xenomorph a great monster. For me, what was and still is beautiful about science fiction is could you have the big giant summer blockbuster package but be diving into serious religious or political or social concepts that sparks people to get together and to communicate and evolve and anytime you can actually do that i i, I think that you know we've done our job Aliens get to be the carrier for some of our guilts and fears around the treatment of other people. For some folks, it's easier to identify with the aliens than with the main characters. Come on, get out, get out! Get out. Get out. That's bloody rude! Come on, get outside, move! In District 9, you have aliens who are stranded on Earth and become refugees. They become stranded above the city of Johannesburg, which has this whole history of apartheid. And it's done like it's a documentary. I thought that was brilliant. They're spending so much money to keep them here when they could be spending it on other things, but as in, at least at least they're keeping them separate from us. And I think they must fix that, that ship and they must go. Hello, hello. We follow a government bureaucrat, uh, Vikas. Okay. This is Vikas van der Merwe from MNU. And uh, we are yet to serve you an eviction notice. He is forced to become an alien and see what it's like to be put into one of these camps and to be cast out of human culture. He is oppressed, he's spit on, he's turned into a government experiment. We shot in Johannesburg, and uh, the shacks that we shot in were real people's homes. All of these shacks around here, all of these residents were moved somewhere else in Joburg, which is exactly what happens to the aliens in the film. Writing District 9 set in South Africa, it never could have been any other way. It, it was terrible, terrible. Like, I get goosebumps even talking about that. Xenophobia was just at its peak at that time. South Africans attacking people from Zimbabwe that were fleeing their country and coming down looking for work. They were putting tires around their neck and lighting them on fire because they were taking their jobs. And they were doing that where we were going to shoot. That, to me, was the most sobering moment to know that this world and this fantasy that you've been writing actually is happening. For some viewers, it's going to seep in that a lot of the things that are being done to these aliens are exactly what humans do to each other. Many of us come from communities that are marginalized. We're already alienated. So science fiction becomes a powerful means of talking about that, particularly when it's doing so deliberately. Somebody has been pulled out of the vehicle. It looks like a human being. It is the story of an oppressor becoming the oppressed. And ultimately, in my mind, it's a story of him gaining his humanity only after he ceases to be human. I think that's what science fiction at its best does. It, it asks those questions. It asks, what is it to be human? And are what we call aliens much more humane than we are? Probably the best example. In Avatar, we are clearly the invading, colonizing, raping, pillaging, destroying species. And it's framed that way explicitly in the story. One of the ideas that Avatar plays with is how the story of an alien encounter would look if told from the point of view of the aliens. I think that if I would have approached Neytiri as an extraterrestrial, I don't think I would have ever tapped into the, the, her heart. <gasps> I need to look at humans as the foreign creatures, as, as, as the tainted species that comes here to take. This story is so simple and it's been told before and we've seen it before that I just need to go back to the past. 
And that was the most humble journey I ever embarked on I, as an artist trying to build a character. As Grace, I got to play a human who also exalts in being in her avatar and in, and in living on the planet as a, as a Navi would. Jim Cameron has created Pandora with its indigenous people, the Navi, as well as this amazing collection of other species. And they live in a primeval world which is colonized by a corporation, not even a country. It's so powerful because it is a reflection of, in fact, the way humans have conducted themselves over the centuries all over the world. When we're shooting that scene, Jim wanted us to dig deeper. We were just crying out for a fallen tree, but it wasn't deep enough. It wasn't as if this tree was your uncle, was your grandparent, was your mother. It's an extension of your body. And he wanted to see that anguish because at that point, what the humans are doing in this planet is wrong and they're not welcome. By that time in the story, we're all part Navi. That scene is really the moment I think that the audience is completely disengaged from the humans and we no longer feel like we have any sympathy for them. I think authors try science fiction specifically because there's something that's making them angry in their current culture or in their political climate. And this is a way for them to shine a light on what it is that has them so frustrated. Close Encounters led to, led to E.T., mm -hmm. which I think of as kind of Close Encounters too, the more mm -hmm. personal. I think, but you, I think of it the same way. It seems like you took many of those themes, those first contact themes, and just made it very kind of family-centric. E.T. was never meant to be a movie about an extraterrestrial. It was meant to be a story about my mom and dad getting a divorce. Uh, right. And so I started writing a story, not a script per se, but I started writing a story about what it was like when your parents uh, divide the family up mm -hmm. and they move to different states. When I was yeah. shooting Close Encounters, and when I did the scene of the little alien coming yeah. out of the mothership yeah. and doing the Kadali hand signs, signals yeah. to yeah. Francois Truffaut, it, it all came together. I thought, wait a second. What if that alien doesn't go back up into the ship? What if he stayed behind? Or maybe what if he even got lost and he was marooned here? Yeah. What would happen if a child of a divorce or a family of a divorce right. with a huge hole to fill, filled the hole with his new yeah. best extraterrestrial friend? Exactly. One of my clearest memories in terms of an early alien film is watching E.T., of course, which was written by Melissa Matheson. She told me, actually, that uh, the original script did not have him dying. And when my dad passed away, she was so impacted by that that she sort of felt that she should write that in for me, in a way, or for, for kids who were, had suffered loss, and make it more than a light affair. Spielberg made a point of designing E.T. to be as empathetic looking as possible, to the point that he had his designer, Carlo Rambaldi, look at pictures of elderly people from the Depression and try to figure out what made these people look empathetic and wise and sad. And then he said, can you mix in a little bit of Albert Einstein? It was very important that E.T. be a, a face that would earn your respect and earn your, your, your fondness. Right. I didn't want a cute little character would come out of the gate, yeah. making the whole audience in unison go, oh, it's <laughs> the last thing I wanted. So that's why I think filmmakers sometimes have to play tricks when they portray aliens, to give them human-like features in order to evoke that kind of feeling of empathy from us. And the reason I was hired for this job is because I have real long, thin fingers, which is my father's fault. Initially, I was hired just to do close-ups, making the communicator, turning pages in a book, touching the plant. Go down to the dirt under, underneath and dig a little bit. You see the dig a little bit. And then the first night, he kind of fell in love with my hands, I guess is the only way to put it. He felt that the combination of the animatronic creature and live hands was the perfect formula. The hand movement, you know, was something that created a sense of engagement, 
gave you something to focus on when you're looking at this strange body. And above all, it gave you a sense of how human beings could project onto the other without, without any negative consequence. So I see a really hug. That's perfect, Henry. I love that, with your chin resting on E.T. Okay. The last hug in the movie is one that's very special to me. This was the opportunity that I actually got to hug Henry. When Henry is saying goodbye to E.T., I am absolutely sobbing. And he's crying and I'm crying. This is what broke my sister up. I had not warned her that it was going to have a sad ending. She recalled the fact that when our mother used to comfort us, it was done in the same way that E.T. comforts Elliot at the very end. So it's not really a pat, but it's kind of a stroke pat at the same time. She says she was hysterical. They almost had to take her out of the, the movie theater. She was crying so loud. So well, let me ask you point blank. Do you think now, with your experience and your view of the world, that aliens exist? I, I wanted to believe. I felt I earned the right to see a UFO. I made mm -hmm. ET. I made close encounters. My goodness, I kept waiting for it. A sighting. I've never had a sighting. I've met hundreds of people. You know they will stay away from you as far as they can because they don't want to empower this myth that you're actually a precursor of an alien invasion. Well, well, you know about this myth, I've heard right? about this that myth. You've been, I know. It's you've insane. been intentionally softening us up for decades now. Right? Well, look, look, you know, I stay away from sharks, but I don't want to stay away <laughs> from UFOs, and yet I've never, ever had the experience. Well, as a or science a fiction writer, normal. that's easy yeah. to solve. This used to be a, like a really hot tourist place and then they left. for the UFOs, and then they realized that they were getting photographed too much, so and they, they, they just embargoed Okay, well, that, 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 I could almost buy that. It would almost help me believe that alien did come here at one time. <laughs> That's a great place to go out. Thank you, my friend. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim.